good to meet you, man. Um, this is uh, my buddy Kyle over here. And uh, yeah, and we're happy to, to have you on. Uh, of course, uh, we, we want to talk about a lot of stuff you got going on, Porcupine Tree, Pineapple Thief Tour, everything. Where are you about now? I'm in Oregon. And uh, yeah, so you're, you're towards the end of the North American tour with Pineapple Thief. That's right. Um, yeah, how's it been going for you so far? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. I mean, we had a bit of a disaster with the bus. The bus broke down for 30 hours. Um, but we got past that and, uh, I think we've got four shows left of a six week tour. Wow. Pretty extensive. Uh, that's awesome. I mean, it's great that you guys get to do something like that now in the States. The popularity has been pretty good for the band over the last couple of years. I mean, are you seeing that in, in, in America? Has it been better than, than previous runs? Uh, sometimes and sometimes not. We get a lot of people who don't, they buy a ticket and then they don't show up. Well, that's the COVID factor, right? I think coming. Yeah, into that play, could yeah. be more than a hundred tickets, hundred and fifty tickets. Some nights, you know, obviously the tour manager's got all the sales, and he says a hundred and fifty people didn't turn up. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, that's crazy. I've I've heard some of that kind of happening. That's that's not great. Yeah. Yeah. But but otherwise, uh, you know, the shows have been going well, and and uh, people seem to be enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. So, Gavin, I've seen where um, you guys have just uh, released Give It Back, where mm -hmm. you re-recorded 12 classic tracks yeah. that uh, you've played live, but you never recorded the drums on them. And so uh, kind of tell us, what was it like reinterpreting and kind of putting your own spin on these songs? Well, it was fun. I mean, I chose the songs. So I went back mm -hmm. through Spotify. The band's got something like 11 albums before I joined. And when I joined them, I'd only played on one record. So obviously I had to pick out some songs to play live. And they were very encouraging to just say, look, you know, this is the version that's been released. Sometimes it's with a drum machine or their old drummer. Just do whatever you want. Rearrange it, change it, do whatever you like. And I did that on the first tour. And then more recently I went through, you know, well, they must have... I don't know, more than 100, 120 songs or something on Spotify. And I would just listen through until I'd find one. I think, oh, I've got a good idea for this one. We could do it like this. And I'd make a note and then I'd ask Bruce to send me the multi-track. And I'd say, look, I think it should be faster and it should be in three instead of four. I'll put down some drumming and I'll give you a new tempo. Can you re-record a guitar and vocal for me to work to? And then I'll rearrange the song and then everyone will replay their parts. So um, it was just whatever song randomly tickled my imagination. <laughs> That's great. It was purely selfish. It wasn't like I was looking for the best song or the strongest songs or the most popular songs. It's not a best of album. It's just truly just random songs that I felt I might have a good idea for. Well, as a drummer, I applaud you for being selfish for once. Singers always yeah. are selfish, you know, so <laughs> why not? Give the drummer some. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, of course, uh, obviously, the, the other big story is uh, Porcupine Tree, a uh, new album, Closer Continuation, uh, comes out on June 24th. Uh, three singles. Uh, the third single just came out uh, recently, Heard Calling, which is uh, another great one. Um, you know, did you resign yourself to the, to the idea that this – may never happen again or or did you always hold out hope that it that it might um well you see when we stopped in 2010 we toured for 14 months so we were pretty burnt out to be honest and we planned to take at least a year off and then that year became two years but after two years i'd already started writing songs with steve not necessarily for a porcupine tree project. We just started writing songs for fun because we live quite close and he would come around and have a coffee and we would talk about things. And one day he picked up my bass and I got on the drums and we started playing and thought, oh, this is fun. We didn't think, hey, this is the new porcupine tree album. And months would go by, sometimes years would go by where we didn't write anything and uh, it wasn't until about 2019 
that we realized, oh, we've got a pretty good album here. I think we should consider the idea of actually making the album. We need to find a record company. You know, we'd had no pressure up till then, which was great. Every other album was under time pressure with a record company, with a management, with uh, promoters, agents, everyone trying to get you to commit to a release date so they can organize a tour right. and promo. You know, you've got to put some pretty big wheels in action to make things happen. People see a tour and they say, oh, I see you're playing San Francisco um, and LA. Why don't you play, can you come to San Diego? It's like, you know what? That decision happened 18 months ago. <laughs> right. We can't, now that the tour's been uh, uh, announced, we can't just go, oh, you know what? We could, we've got a day off. Let's go to San Diego. <laughs> you know, these things are decided so long ago, as with every post you do on Facebook where you say, here are the dates, then people put, come to, well, come, to Brazil, there, come to Brazil come to Brazil is always the one that that come pops to Brazil up. come to Argentina <laughs> come to Volta Regis come to I've heard every you know town name in the world <laughs> why aren't you coming to Mumbai why aren't you coming to Brisbane blah 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 <laughs> those decisions were made so long ago we couldn't just slot them in now the tour's released uh I mean I guess people you know want to try to make you think that oh there's so many fans here you've got to come but there's so many factors in deciding a tour um it's not as simple as just looking at all the comments on facebook and saying well a lot of people say we should go here it, it's nothing like that yeah well actually speaking of of the tour that that kicks off in september uh your north american tour here um you know, have you guys already started talking about what you might play or, or rehearsing and what can fans expect? What can you tell us? I believe we're going to play the whole of the new album, the seven songs that are on the new album. Nice. Not necessarily the three extra tracks. And then a selection of songs from the uh, back catalogue. We have got a very good idea of the songs we're going to play. And uh, we did do a week's rehearsal in April uh, also to try out our new bass player and guitar player as well. Right. Yeah, actually, Randy McStein, uh, he's a friend of ours and uh, we were very, very excited for him. I was on uh, Cruise to the Edge. I'm one of the co-hosts on there and, and I see Randy on there. He plays with like every band on the ship, basically. <laughs> and... Yeah. Uh, the news came out during that uh, that week while he was on on the cruise. It was fantastic. Very excited. Yeah. I mean, he had known for quite a few months. Yeah, I bet. Uh, we told him to keep quiet about it, <laughs> and uh, then we released the news of him and Nathan. So, yeah, they're great. Yeah, very cool. He had a really nice post about it on social media about his phone blowing up when the, when the news came out. It's always fun. So. Um, for, for we, uh, you know, music writers who get to live vicariously through musicians. So um, I guess with it being I, what a decade or longer since Porcupine Tree performed together uh, publicly, at least. Um, and this is sort of a silly question, perhaps, but in that decade, you've done a ton of stuff. So coming to this record, which I know you'd started writing on it years and years and years ago. But did you approach the recording of this album differently than you did with the incident? Any Any sort of different creative approach to it? Not really. I mean, I recorded it at home, which is how I recorded Dead Wing and Fear of a Blank Planet. The incident we recorded at, or at least recorded the drums at Air Studios. And I got home and thought, oh man, I wish I'd have recorded this at home. I like the sound of the drum sound I get in my home studio and there's no pressure. When you go in a big studio and you're paying two, three thousand a day, well, there's pressure to get it done. And not every day you might feel really in the mood. So some of it could feel a bit forced. And you're always aware of the, the, the time pressure and the budget going out the window. So at home, if you do a few takes on one song and you think, mm, I don't know, I'll just go and ride my bike. I'll come back to it tomorrow. That's fine. That's probably the best thing you can do. 
if you have to hand, you know, finish it by four o'clock, well, then you might end up with something that you're not 100% happy with. Yeah. Well, so, um, no, I don't think anything really, I don't think anything that happened in the last 10 years changed my approach to it, but I think I feel happiest recording in my own studio. Yeah, very cool. Uh, just a quick question for that. Do you record by yourself at your home studio or do you have an engineer come in and help you out or what? No, it's just me. Just you. It's yeah. all set up. I've got a. I've got everything laid up. Everything's mic'd up. I guess I've done a 25 year sound check in that studio. <laughs> so I've got it you about got the level set. dialed in as I could possibly dial anything in. It's always the same. And it's also nice that I could wake up one morning and think, oh, I've got an idea and I can be in record in 10 seconds. Yeah. Um, where in the past you might have a good idea and then you're going to book a, a recording studio, get your drums in the car, drive it, you know, that's a whole different process. So yeah. it's a luxury having a, a really good studio with all the top microphones and the drum kit permanently set up, uh, ready to go anytime I want to play. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So there's a video that came out about four or five days ago as of the airing of this, let's just say recently on the Porcupine Tree YouTube uh, called Gear Talk and did one with all three members. But uh, I thought the one with you was great. You shared some details, uh, kind of helped me understand some of this. And I love as a drummer to think about the little details and the gear you're using and all that kind of stuff. So I guess versus, you know, the incident and the tour that followed and, and now what are the big changes to your, your drum setup, your cymbals, your equipment, anything that you've changed kind of in terms of recording or performances? I think those sort of changes are interesting, at least from my perspective. Yeah, very, very little. The drum, yeah. the drum kit, I mean, I've got about, four, I don't know, four Sona drum sets. They're all the same sizes. Most of them are maple. One of them's made out of birch. They all sound really, really good. Um, I've probably evolved into different microphones over the last 10 years. You know, sometimes I go in a studio and someone's using a certain microphone and I think, oh, that sounded good. And then I might hire that microphone and test it against the microphone I was already using and decide whether I want to change to that one or send it back. Um, I got a, a, yeah, probably quite a lot of mics in the last 10 years, but then we were talking two, three, four percent of difference, a very, very tiny amount of difference, yeah. not something that, that's going to change the world. How does that vamp or how does that uh, compare to between the other albums you'd worked on? Was there a lot more change? I guess the question kind of becomes, and I think it's probably true of a lot of artists, is you sort of land on your signature sound, your approach. There's not as much fiddling around. Same same with like a chef or with any other expert in any other field, I guess, but or like a film director, perhaps like you sort of develop your own kind of approach to things. Um, was there a lot more changing in the early years of Porcupine Tree or has it pretty much been the same sort of approach since then, I guess? It's pretty much the same thing. The, the signature sound actually comes from you. It doesn't come from the equipment. Yeah. It doesn't come from the microphones, the analog to digital converters or anything like that. The sound actually comes out of you and you just make the sound that you like come out from what is ever in front of you. An interesting story is that on the last King Crimson tour, we had the Zappa band as our opening band. And I talked to the drummer, Joe Travers, and he said, hey, do you know a Zappa song? And I said, actually, I do know a song. It's called What's New in Baltimore. He said, hey, we know that song. Come on up and play it with the band. And I said, well, hang on. Let me just have a listen to it. I haven't <laughs> played it in a long time. It's really hard. So, yeah, OK. So he said, like, in New York, I'll just announce you. You come on, play the song, get off. So I had to play his drums. He's got a DW kit, all different sizes to mine, big drums and different heads with black dots on and all the tunings different, a metal <laughs> snare, 23 inch bass drum, DW pedals that I don't use, 
everything was different. And I didn't have time to move anything, not even the stall. I just sat down and had to play his drums. And as you know, as a drummer, that's quite a hard thing to do because everyone puts it in kind of silly places that you can't reach or feel uncomfortable to you. But the kit was a very, very different kit to mine. And at the end, I played the song and at the end of the concert, the King Crimson sound engineer came backstage and he said, a really weird thing happened. When you came on tonight and played on Joe Travers drums to play with Zappa Band, you made his kit sound just like your Sona kit that you play with King Crimson later in the evening. Isn't that weird? Yeah. That weird. Just the way you hit them makes so much more difference than the actual drums, heads, mics, all the other, all the other stuff. It shows you that the sound is actually within you. The instrument's just a sort of an illusion. It's just a, it's just a, a sort of loudspeaker. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You well, know, you're going to have something to spend money on though. You know? so, <laughs> right. Those yeah, of us yeah. who are indoors. Well, they right? look pretty, right? The drums yeah. look good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It just, uh, that's a great story. It confirmed, it confirmed to me something, you know, I've got about, or I had about 50 snare drums. I kind of made them all sound the same, to be honest because I've got an ideal drum sound in my head and I try to play the drum to get that sound. Now, some of them, I can find that sound a bit easier than others, but at the end of the day, I pretty much made all of them sound very, very, very similar. So I, I sold at least 30 of them. I could probably sell another 15 of them. It doesn't really, it's not that important in the in the sound that comes out of or what you consider might be a signature sound is really what's in you more than anything else yeah i want to ask you a little bit about some of the tracks on the new record um first of all the herd calling the the recent single we talked about um that really starts off with you on on the track and it sounds like maybe that overall inspired the, the song is that rhythm is that how that one came about yeah Steve said, look, uh, well, we thought we've got an album. Maybe we need one more song. So what should we do? Let's try something with a really quirky rhythm. And he said, do you have anything like that? And I said, I've got about a thousand things like that. Steve. <laughs> right. So uh, that was, in fact, that was the first thing I sent him. I said, it's in 11. It's got an unusual kind of lope to it. And um, if you don't like that, let me know. I've got hundreds of others. And he wrote the, the guitar line kind of around the rhythm of the drums. And it sounded really good. It wasn't, I hadn't got a, a preconceived idea of what the guitar or the bass should do along with that rhythm. Um, but it sounded really good, really quick. And we said, well, look, maybe we can have a section that's really whisper quiet and then a section that's really massive, massively dynamically heavy. And then there's a middle section that sounds a bit like it's in six, but it's still 11. And then the end section sounds a bit like it's in four, but it's still an 11. Um, you know, there's kind of tricks you can do where you place the backbeat that make right. people think, oh, this is two and four, or this is in, six eight because it's in the middle of the bar so i used a few of those tricks just to give us uh some different um rhythmic options but the whole thing is in 11. yeah you uh you mentioned something in that gear talk video that I already alluded to about harridan which was the first single on this one um it's in five four and something about you riding it when you're on an airplane and i what you talked about what i thought was interesting and I've heard other artists say this, and I, I'm not a musician on your level, but um, if I'm writing for a podcast or doing other things, like for some reason, like the airplane is like my creative, like I don't know, happy place or something. But um, talk a little bit about how I think you're in South Africa and you wrote the the rhythm to that or something. Yeah, it, actually, it's just traveling. Sometimes when I'm on a bus or even on my bicycle or I'm in the car, something about the motion, I think puts my mind in a place where ideas might float because I know I'm not sitting at the drums. 
Yeah. Um, so ideas might come to me when I'm just riding a bicycle or driving down the road or sitting on a plane. And I, I'd done some drum clinic. I'd made some drum clinics in South Africa and I was on my way home and I was on the plane. And then suddenly out of nowhere, I just thought of this rhythm in five and I got my boarding pass and I wrote it down the back of the boarding pass. And a couple of weeks later, Steve came around my house and I said, Hey, Steve, I've got this rhythm I want to play you. And I imagine a bass line, a quite bubbly bass line. And I think I probably sung him a rhythm of a bass line, but without the notes. So I just want you to go do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, or whatever. And I'm going to play this drum. So he starts off playing that rhythm on one note along with the drums. And then very quickly, he came up with a bass line. And then within about five minutes, we thought, oh, this is really good. So that's the first the whole first section of Harridan was written in five minutes. And I think we wrote the whole piece in uh, in one afternoon. That's Other amazing. songs <laughs> took weeks. Other, you know, a song like Chimera's Wreck, that probably took weeks to write that, to find all those pieces. There's also a few bonus tracks on the, on the album, three of them that, um, really are some of my favorite songs on the, on the whole album. Uh, you know, never have is, uh, I just, I can't, couldn't get that one out of my head when I first heard it. Um, you know, talk about, uh, you know, this, I know the sequencing and, and the idea of the album is more, maybe more important to an artist, you know, like Steven and yourselves, you know, more than many artists. So talk about having those three songs. Was there an attempt to fit them within the structure of the record yeah. where they want? Yeah. I mean, how does that work out? I guess at one point we thought, hey, we could put all 10 out, uh, all 10 songs. But because we're old fashioned and maybe Steve and Richard are a bit more uh, vinyl orientated than I am, it's like, well, we, we want it to fit on a vinyl. We want it to be about 45, 47 minutes. We want it to be able to have two sides. And so let's pick a set list of that's going to make up those 47 minutes, 45 minutes, I can't remember. Uh, very much on the idea that if we, if you just put out an, an album that's, you know, two hours long, most people won't get past the first 10 minutes, but maybe with an <laughs> album of 45 minutes, they could hear it as an album. And the flow of the songs was important to us, even though I guess people can listen to it in any order they want to. Um, it just kind of felt like the right thing. Yeah, we had many discussions about, or oh, maybe that song could replace that song, or what if we left this one on and used that one? What if we had the instrumental on the album? Um, and in the end, the best shape we could make it was to have those three as bonus tracks. Yeah, they still fed great. I mean, if you listen to all 10 and... and... Yeah. There's not a there's not a bad song on the record, so it just still kind of you know it it still works really great. I want to ask you a little bit about some of your, you know, I, I don't want to call them like older songs, classic Porcupine Tree songs, things like that that you've played. Do you have any favorites that stand out to you? Any favorite moments from previous records that um, maybe you want you're looking forward to playing, or just songs that you like in general? Yeah, there's quite a few of the back catalog that I enjoyed playing and. Quite a few of those will be in the set list. Um, you know, from a drummer point of view, you need to kind of pace yourself a little bit to not go too crazy playing all the heavy songs one after another. You need to sort of conserve your energy a little bit. Um, but yeah, there's there's quite a few that will be in the concert. One of my... Um all-time favorite drum fills and you tell me if it's if it ranks up there for you as as good but uh the sound of music drum fill before the last chorus that comes in that's always one that just sticks in my mind i think it was the first porcupine tree song i ever heard really but just uh not not a whole lot to ask you about that but I just wonder if that's one that you remember and one that you always have to play the same way when you do it is that important to you in general drum fills to play them the same way live absolutely not in fact i try my best to not play the same ones as the record 
you know, I die. My nightmare is people air drumming along to me. I, I don't <laughs> well, I have to tell you, I do uh, air drum to you a lot in the car. I'm just going to tell well, you. <laughs> you. You won't be able to do that live because the film won't be the same. I mean, the film, the film that I played at that moment in that record in 2002 was probably the best one I could think of at that time when I did it. 20 years later, yeah, I could think of a lot of other fields. And, you know, you'll probably see on YouTube, there's about four or five versions of that song that I used to play at drum clinics. And I don't think I ever played that film again. That's amazing. I mean, there's a, a kind of uh, a camp of people who think, well, the drum fills should be the same every night. And so should the guitar solo should be the same. It depends where you're coming from. I'm coming from a much more jazz perspective where it feels like a cop out to just play the same fills in the same place every night. That's kind of less interesting to me. Trying to think of a brand new one every night or different ones to the record. Uh, I might have a better idea. I might find a better fill or something that I think is a bit more interesting. I might do that for a few nights, then I might think of another one. And it was a surprise to the band because in 2002, when I started to play live with Porcupine Tree, their previous drummer used to play exactly the same note for note every night. And Steve always played the same guitar solo and Colin always played the same bass fill. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. That's just an approach and maybe some people even like going to a concert and seeing that and thinking, oh, great, he played that drum fill and then he played that bass fill and then Steve played the guitar so exactly the same. That's all fine. There's, there's lots of bands who do that and that's nothing wrong with that at all. I'm not from that mentality. I've, I'm kind of more impressed if someone's going to play different stuff or improvise completely new stuff every night. That's quite an interesting challenge. When I was in King Crimson, I used to play a drum solo every night. And the challenge to me was to play a different drum solo every night. It might not be the best things I can play, but I can tell when people are regurgitating their favorite licks that they've practiced a million times. And for the sake of my own sanity, I didn't want to just regurgitate all my licks into a solo. So, and of course, all the guys in the band had heard what I played last night and the night before that and so on and so on. So in a way to try to make things really interesting, I deliberately tried to play a completely different drum solo every night in King Crimson. And it was exciting, scary, dangerous um <laughs> well that's king crimson right <laughs> ultimately very rewarding yeah. you know maybe one in every four or five i thought was pretty good some nights i thought well oh, i don't know i sometimes i would think of because just before i played the solo one of the other drummers was playing and there was a sax solo so i had about two minutes three minutes to think okay what shall i do and then sometimes I would have an idea. And then in the last second, just before I started to play, I'd just do something else. And so the best drum solos were the ones where I literally didn't know what was going to happen in the next second. And I got to trust my instinct that I could pull myself out of a nosedive. And, you know, improvising is quite a skill. And you need to develop it and you need to do it live in front of an audience to feel what yeah. that feels like so yeah i would play different drum fills to porcupine tree songs and just a lot of different subtle variation not change the groove or put the backbeat in a different place but just subtle things i would do all the time it's never the same twice that's great yeah well i'll just say i appreciate the improvisational approach to it. I, I think what's interesting, and I, I've seen you talk about this, your dad was a jazz drummer. You were kind of raised in that ilk, if it, if you want to say it like that. Um, from a recording perspective, though, I think one thing I appreciate about, appreciated about you is that you're a very precise drummer. It feels very calculated, very thought out, very balanced. 
But then when I've seen you live and it's different, I like that side of it as well. So whatever's going on intellectually as you build these things and as you think of it in a very, I mean, intelligent, like studied way, I, I also like the side that leans into doing it differently. As a fan, that's that's more rewarding. And I've seen like, you know, maybe the, the apex of like having a fill and playing it faithfully every night's like maybe Neil Peart or something like he's sort of known for that. Um, and that's great too. Um, but, but I, I applaud you for doing that and taking those challenges. So, um, speaking of drummers and King Crimson, <laughs> we had this question just perfectly baked in. Um, you got to share drum, drum duties with one of my favorite drummers, uh, Pat Mastelato, uh, in 2008. And then you went on to where you had three drummers, uh, from 2014 until last December. What are some of the challenges? Cause I've never played in a band with two, certainly not with three drummers, but what are those challenges and which did you prefer just two or with three? Well, it's, yeah, it's tough writing uh, arrangements for three drummers. You can't imp all improvise at the same point. It will just be right. like a fire in a pet shop. So, um, you know, Robert asked me to arrange the three drummer thing. And in the beginning, it was with Bill Riflin and Pat Mastelotto. So you've got to take into account their style, their sound, what they can do on the drums. You know, it's easy to sit at home and record yourself three times, but something I might do naturally might be very awkward and uncomfortable for another drummer to do. They might think, oh, well, how do you do that? Why? I think, well, I've never thought about it, but it just, it's just always felt good, easy to me. And likewise, they might show me something they do and I think, Oh, that's really awkward for me. So some of the arrangements, you know, had to get uh, tweaked when we got in a rehearsal room and tried to play it. The original demos of me recorded three times. Well, that wasn't that hard, but I know what I can play. So it, it was kind of easy, but hearing it with two other drummers and apart from stylistically they had a very different drum sets and very different sounds available to them so we had three very different drum kit sounds on stage and um it took a while to find the right way to uh, arrange for three drummers but it's got to be very organized and there are times where you just say okay well you play this section and the other two drummers are going to sit out and then you could just do whatever you like you can improvise as much as you want but when three of us are playing we need to get like in between each other we never wanted to play bass drums together and snare drums together mm -hmm. as i have seen sometimes with two drummer bands the drummers are just playing the same thing so it's just like flam city and <laughs> it would be even even more extreme with three drummers and none of us really wanted that sound of three guys all playing the same thing what's the point so we tried to avoid three backbeat snare drum hits and three downbeat bass drum hits. So it would be one guy's going to do that. Maybe the next guy's going to play an eighth note later. And then, uh, you know, it was quite a, quite a challenge to do it. Yeah. It's not an easy thing to do. I still have to see that show. I, the, the, the couple of times it's come my area, I haven't had a chance to do it. So um it, uh, plans for any more king crimson tours after this current cycle of things you're doing no cool i don't i don't know what's going to happen to king crimson but there's no plans that i know of yeah well listen man you've been busy you got a lot going on really appreciate the time it's it's a pleasure to speak to you one of my favorite drummers i'm sure one of kyle's as well and uh Love the, love the new Pork Butcher record. So happy you guys uh, put out something new. Really, it's it's made made the year for us for sure. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. As always, the drums sound huge and tight and always creatively different, which is what I appreciate about you. So, yeah. great. great work. Again, um, closure continuation comes out uh, June twenty fourth. Check out the singles online. Check it out on Spotify and all those places. And uh, tour is uh, in, in September. I'm sure uh, you can find out all the dates online on uh, porkpartree.com or on their Facebook page and all that stuff. Um, Gavin, again, good luck to you, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. All right, man. Bye.